I must let you all on a secret. It's not every day that you get such a wonderful satsang, such an opportunity to be. So I'm not too sure if you will feel honored or privileged that I am here, but I can promise you, I feel extremely honored, privileged and recharged to be amid such wonderful people who think of giving something of themselves back to society. I think that intent itself is an extraordinary um, uh, feeling to have. You know, Swami Vivekananda, if you can crystallize his entire philosophy in one sentence, he puts it so beautifully. He says, be good, do good, as simple as that. And then, you know, if you, if you would actually scratch the surface and deconstruct it, that's possibly the greatest uh, spiritual evolution path that you can, anybody can take. Because in today's world, the challenge is being good. And the bigger challenge is wanting to do good also, because the moment you start wanting to do good, then there's so many, so many other challenges that come with it. But that apart, I'm going to start off with a question. I know there are around 70, 75 people on this uh, session. How many of you feel restless doing what you're doing? Forget volunteering for a minute. Forget all these questions. Just as human beings, all of many of you will live 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of your life. If I were to throw a question at you and say, in, how many of you feel income, or rather I'll change the question. How many of you are feeling completely fulfilled, complete, satisfied, and absolutely grounded in life? I would love to meet such a person. So I'll, I'll, I, in the framing the questions, how many of you don't feel, I would really like to meet a person who's completely fulfilled, grounded, rested, unaffected, the set of pragna state that Bhagwan Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita. I, I don't see any hands. Akshay always is earning for more. Uh, it is difficult, right? This question looks simple, but if you were to actually spend some time reflecting on it, the enormity of asking, I mean, most of us go through life, we live, die without even asking this question, right? We just pass on and we don't even ask, are we even fulfilled or what is fulfillment even? What does it even mean? We are all so mechanistic in our existence that we don't even stop to pause and ask. We don't even discover the restlessness in us. Uh, so if I were to ask this question, among the 75 of you, how many of you don't feel restless? Sir, not all the times, but at times, definitely. But you feel restless because if you're not restless, you won't be volunteering. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. I, I believe the greatest asset uh, uh, is for volunteering is restlessness. Because we are all restless. We are restless because we think so much of change needs to be done. We are restless because we want to see good happen. We are restless because we want to see every child in school. We are restless because we don't want to see anybody die of lack of health care. We are restless because we don't want to can't see a hungry child. And so if you're not restless, then I think E Vidya Loka may not be the place for you. And the very fact you come on to the session as volunteers of E Vidya Loka means you are restless. Restlessness can be of two kinds. Some of us are restless for our own selves. That's also restlessness. I want to make a million dollars. I want to be well known. I want to be a great hero. I want to be getting the Nobel Prize. I want to solve the world's problems. I want to be Donald Trump or I want to challenge him and be Joe Biden. We all have this restlessness. That's okay. But many of us also have a different kind of restlessness. And I think that's a restlessness I would like to talk about today. Feeling restless in a constructive way is possibly the greatest asset any human being can have. Because in that restlessness, we seek to discover in the, in the, you know, the journey for trying to reduce the restlessness, if it manifests as doing good to others, if it manifests as enabling others to live a productive life, I think then our, our, our very purpose of existence is done. In a, in a letter to the Mysore Maharaja, everything I know is Vekhanda. So you'll hear his name maybe 20 times in my talk in 20 minutes. I really cannot, I un unashamedly plagiarize his thoughts. So I have no problems with that. He, in a letter to the, I'm from Mysore. So um, Mysore is a special place. We've had some very great kings in the past, but Vivekananda had the courage to call a spade a spade. In one letter to the Mysore Maharaja, and Mysore Maharaja gave him substantial money to go to the US. He writes a letter to him and says, hey prince, and then after a few things of ex exchange of pleasantries, he says, the vanities of life are transient. Now try telling this to ourselves, it's so difficult, but try telling it to a Maharaja who's used to only the vanities of life. He says, the vanities of life are transient. 
but he alone lives who lives for others. The rest are more dead than alive. I think we all suffer from a restlessness which keeps us alive. And that restlessness is giving of ourselves to others. And I think an expression of this giving, a practical expression, a pragmatic balance between our own familial pressures, our own professional lives, is finding the space, finding the energy, finding the talent to give of ourselves in platforms like A Vidya Loka. And so I would like to congratulate Brinda, Venkat and everybody in the team, Anant and everybody else for enabling and creating this platform, which is a space. You know, the brand names don't matter. I think platforms matter. Vivekananda Youth Movement, A Vidya Loka, all brand names, which all die away after some time. What we need to look at is, is that platform giving us the space to constructively express our restlessness for humanity to progress? And so I would like to wish you all, congratulate you for giving a space of your life, giving a slice of your life to something bigger than yourselves. And what you are doing may not even be recognized by many of you, may not even be seen by many of you. Unfortunately, education is a very nuanced sector. You know, being in healthcare, uh, and also so many other things that the Vivekananda Youth Movement does today, starting off at healthcare, I started off as a physician with just treating tribal patients in the forest. It's a very glamorizing job. It can reaffirm your existence every evening. Every evening you save four lives, you feel, oh my God, I've done great things. But education is not like that. You've got to invest 10, 15, 20 years of your life in a child. And possibly after that, the child may look around and say, oh, something they did for me, right? So volunteering, I can get my adrenaline every evening when I suture a patient, when I deliver a child, when I do something in the operating room. But in the space of education, when, when, when change takes generations to manifest, it's very difficult to keep ourselves inspired and continue to do what we do. A simple marks card could be a small little milestone, but real impact of education takes time. And that is exactly why the work that you're doing, doing is so powerful, so sacred, and so very ennobling for everybody who understands it. But I'm going to spend some time talking about, what, you know, very simplistically, what do we need what do we really need? And uh, again, to go back to Vivekananda, he says, to be in this space, you know, we all like to be in social space. It's a very difficult call. I used to remember when I used to travel to Bangalore and I would sit in the train and go, the person next to me picks up a conversation and one day the person next to me asks me, what do you do for a living? How do you tell him I'm living in a forest? I'm uh, running a clinic. I have a hospital. I have a school. We have livelihood work, we mobilize communities, we sue the government, we get beaten up, we get arrested. You can't explain all that in five minutes when introducing yourself. Sometimes it's easy to introduce and say, I'm a doctor and they'll not ask you some questions. But I always realize, and there may be doctors in the audience today, if you say you're a doctor in a public transport vehicle, the next, next 15, 20 minutes, you'll have to give free consultation. Now, every disease the other man can think about will come only at that point of time. And he'll say, oh, my talena willi, kaino willi, all kinds of pains and aches and all that. And so I found a simple secret. I would tell that I'm a doctor who without examination cannot give any prescription. Whether it's a headache or a nail ache, you'll have to strip. Then I can examine you and then tell you what is wrong with you. And after that, nobody will talk to me. So we all discover this kind of simple tools to live your life. And one person asked me, what do you do? Yen Martira, what do you do for a living? And I said, uh, I'm a social worker. Because I thought that's a nice dignified answer. That fellow laughed and said, everybody says this answer. And he thought, you know, the word social work was so ridiculed. The word social work was so seen as something so inferior. And uh, uh, he said, every politician calls himself a social worker. What, is, what are you talking? Are you a politician? He asked me. So I found it so difficult, right? How do you even tell somebody that you are interested in making change? You're interested in making sure that you can move the needle in the, in the proper direction. You're interested in making this world a better place. These sound like cliches. How do you explain it to somebody on a train? It's so difficult. And how do you even say what is, and he asked me, then the next question he asked me is what actually sent me on a real reflective uh, thought. He said, okay, to do social work, what should you study? You know, those days people didn't equate MSWs for, uh, social work. Now the government of India is actually considering bringing about, you know, destroying the very spirit of social work and saying we'll have a council which will do social work. And then you're going to set up like a bar council of India, press council of India, they want to set up a social work council of India. And if you're not registered there, we are all illegal 
in doing what we are doing. So even to do good, now you have to be legal. Anyway, that is the way our government is thinking currently. But beyond that, that aspect, what is it we need? Then I was thinking, asking myself, do I need to become a doctor? Do I need to be an engineer? Do I need to be studying physics, chemistry, maths? Do we need those qualifications to do good? Or is it something else? How can I be, a, I'm sure Venkat and others would be asked this question. Do we need to be a volunteer, right? Do we need to, to be a volunteer, what should we be? Should we be qualified, trained? We all have these questions. And I would go back to what Vivekananda, this question was asked to Vivekananda by Alasinga Perumal, one of his favorite disciples. You know, he, he, in, in one, one day in sheer frustration, Perumal burst out yeah, and Vivekananda and said, you know, you keep telling us serve society, serve society. You keep saying Atmano Mokshartam Jagatitaya Chai. You know, knowledge of the self can only be through the expression of social work to the outside world. How do we do it? Come on, give us some to-do steps, practical A, B, C, D steps. And Vivekananda laughs and says, he says, you don't need, and then he asks him, should I be a doctor? Should I be an engineer? Should I be a teacher and go around the villages and teach? What do I do? Tell me. And Swamiji in his own inimical way, he answers, he says, oh, you don't have to do anything. All you need to do is make sure you're qualified with the three H, he says. He says, the first is the heart to feel. And he gives this call. He says, feel my children, feel. Feel for the poor, the downtrodden, the marginalized. Feel till you think that your head reels and your heart will stop and you'll fall down dead. If that kind of feeling, then you're ready for this kind of work. So we need to feel. We need to feel that even today, millions of children don't, can't have access to a decent education. A child in Mysore three months ago committed suicide in the district of Mysore, not in the city of Mysore. Why? Because his poor parents, agricultural laborers, schoolies could not afford the digital smartphone that the child was pestering the mother for because the government simply announced online classes. It's very easy to say online. Online for whom? In a world of digital divide where things are real. It's not just a figment of people's imagination. I'm sure many of you would have faced this. But this child kept on asking his father and his teacher kept on scolding the child saying that why are you coming to class? You're such a good student. Why don't you come to class? And this child couldn't take it. Parents are not able to buy it. The teacher is scolding her and she just committed suicide. Eight standard girl. How can we live in a country where a 13 year old child with its entire future ahead of it just gets snuffed out only because we couldn't provide it a simple little, you know, if you, if you buy, give it a second hand phone, it is 1000, 1500 rupees today but we lost the child, right? Every child matters to this country. And when you feel, when you feel strongly and say, how did I let this happen in my soul? I, I couldn't sleep for a week after that. How did we allow this not get, come to know about this at all? And then Swamiji says, only with that kind of feeling can you begin your journey. And then he talks about the next hedge, the head to think. Romanticized version of emotion is no longer sufficient, my friends. It's all very nice to feel, I'll go out and change this world. But that is a big mistake. Don't jump in emotionally. Emotion is nice. It's a good starting point. In the world of leadership, we say motivation is the first step of leadership. But motivation is only the first step. It's not the only thing that is there for leadership. We need inspiration. We need motivation. We need to understand that we need to do something. But beyond that, we need the head to think. Strategy is what we need. The world's problems cannot be tackled by just feeling that we want to do something. We need to think how, what to do with this feeling. How do we go about strategizing? How do we look at reaching out? No, it's so beautiful to understand 100,000 learning hours. How do you understand where the learning is going? What are the learning outcomes? How is each child progressing? How long will the effort take? What is the cumulative impact of one volunteer hour on a child? Is the child truly learning? These are very important questions. Sometimes when we do good, we have this big burden of doing good. We all think we are a martyr and we can't be asked questions. I'll teach, that's it. I'm doing good. But are you even competent to be teaching? Just because you're a PhD doesn't mean you're a damn good teacher. Just because you've done specialized in physics, chemistry, math doesn't mean you can teach science to a primary school teacher, primary school child. There are different tools that you need to acquire. So we need the competence to even volunteer today. Volunteering cannot be just run by your intent to do good. You may actually be doing harm. So be careful. So in our all intent, it's like medicines, right? Whenever as doctors, we prescribe medicines, our principle, like William Osler said, is to see how to minimize harm. We are not even sure we're doing good, but at least can we minimize harm? So you need to acquire that extra talent. And I'm glad Evidya Loka has got training programs and various ways in which they infuse you all with this kind of input. And I think it's so critical. 
And so coming with the prefix mindset, that I know what the problems of education are and how I can solve it. Working with people who have understood it a little deeper and platform like e with Loka and then going a little deeper and acquiring the skill sets, that is strategization. That is ahead to think. And then we can all design and say, I can tell you exactly how universal healthcare can be given in India. But what's the point if I can design it and not do anything about it? The hands to work. So we need the heart to feel, the head to think, and the hands to work, my friends. And that is the beginning phase of volunteering itself. But we all do good. And a lot of challenges will come. You know, it's sometimes very easy for us to think that we're all doing good. And Vivekananda says so beautifully, he says, when you start this journey, many of us don't persevere. You'll all see people, and I'm sure Venkat and Brinda will have stories to say, first year you may have a thousand volunteers, second year it will become 900 and some of the new 100 comes, third year the old 300 goes away, the new 400 comes. So difficult to sustain, right? I've been in this space for 36 years, just December 1st we completed 36 years of organization. Sometimes I feel very old, I am actually old, but I feel young at heart. And then you suddenly realize, what do I, what am I, uh, you know, uh, how do we sustain? A lot of people ask me, how do you sustain? How are you doing what you're doing? Can you give us a secret of your sustenance? My secret of sustenance is selfishness. It's so important to be selfish. We've got to think of ourselves. We've got to be selfish in understanding that in doing good is actually inner growth for ourselves. The world is so pathetically one-sided that we are all programmed only to look at consumerist growth for ourselves. Build my house, buy my car, live a nice life, and then what? We forget what next, right? A lot of people used to make fun and say, did you have to go to Harvard to go sit in a village? No, but that's the beauty of it, right? I would have sat in the village even without any education. But the whole idea I'm trying to communicate is the selfishness is in the need for personal evolution. Unless we can see our own spiritual growth in the outer expression of social work. And it's okay to be selfish in a good way in that sense. We can't sustain this. Because spiritual hunger is not something which maybe at least for me, you can't get fulfilled. We, we are not a Vivekananda, we are not a Ramana Maharishi or a Aurobindo or a Ramakrishna Paramahamsa to say in this lifetime, we can know our, know our true selves. This journey of discovering your true self is spirituality. And the discovery of a true self is only by the external expression of what yourself can do to the others. And I think that's what volunteering is all about. If I were to capture the spirit of volunteering in one sentence, each of you are embarking on a journey, not of doing good at all, you're embarking on a journey of recognizing your true self through the act of doing good. And that way you don't have to worry about sustenance. If you, to me, today it may be Evitya Loka, tomorrow it may be some other organization. The society is a huge place. You might find your own pursuits of doing good. But if you lose sight of your inner growth, I think you're not doing good to yourself. And that's a big danger. And Vivekananda wants of it so beautifully. You know, I went through it. You can call it the dark night of the soul. You can call it whatever you want. Sometimes when you are in this space and working, you start believing that, oh, I'm doing good. I must be really a great guy. Thousands of patients come to our hospital. Hundreds of children go through our school. You know, so many children study because of us. There's so many instances which can make you proud and happy. And we start getting carried away in the belief that I'm making a difference. And that I is such a poison. It comes in without our knowledge. And it came to me too. It comes in without our recognizing it even. And then it takes over and you start doing it not for doing good to others, but because you want others to see you be doing good. We want to tom tom our volunteering with the rest of the world. We want to tell the world, oh, I'm volunteering, I'm going to be with the local. I'm teaching five children. We forget that children being taught is more important. We start saying, I am teaching children. But the true spirit of volunteering is not about I doing something. It's about seeing ourselves as instrument through whom something gets done. And that is spiritual growth that each of you need to acquire. Otherwise, there's no difference between you and anybody else in this world. So for us, volunteering should not be a simplistic going out there helping any child to study. Volunteering is all about ensuring that the child's academic performance improves and seeing ourselves as instrument through which change happens. You know, the very statement that Vivekananda writes, and it looked as though he wrote it for me. He says, all the schools you construct, all the hospitals you build, can crumble to dust in one earthquake and get, and get, or get washed away in one cyclone. So please remember, it is not you who are doing, but consider yourself privileged through whom all this is getting done. And that's all I would say before I conclude. Each of you should consider yourself privileged and understand that things are getting done through you. And in conclusion, my only caution, 
and I've seen this, hundreds of volunteers pass through our organizations. Some of them are extraordinary human beings. Some of them are just passers by. Some of them are tourists. So each of us have our own reasons for why we do what we do without standing in judgment of that. The only caution, having lived in the villages and the forest for more than 30 years, the only caution I would give is we shouldn't carry the urban Indians burden into our villages. Let's not forget these villages have existed for thousands of years. These schools have been there. Children have been there. Education has happened. It's not as though you're discovering a new problem today which you want to solve. We've all had problems. We've had people who have solved them. We've had people who are trying to solve them. So we don't have to carry our feel that it's our burden to solve the world's problems or India's problems. We do a bit. So don't carry it as a burden into the system. And most importantly, respect traditional wisdom. Don't be the provider. Don't say, stand on a pedestal and say, here, my poor man, take my five cents, like Vivekananda says. Just respect embedded wisdom that is so full in Indian communities. You may not have the antenna to recognize it. That doesn't mean the embedded wisdom is not there. I can tell you for having lived with them for so long, what they need is not our help or intervention. What they need is a partner to help them recognize their own true inner strength. And if you can be that to a child, I think your job is done. Thank you. And any questions, I'll be happy to respond to that. Thank you so much, Anand, Thank again you. for moderating. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. This was a very inspiring talk, right from the feeling of restlessness. You mentioned the 3H and how doing inner good, uh, how doing good is a, can be seen as a selfish yet positive thing. And you ended with beware of being, uh, being beware of the I. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. We'll now open for uh, questions. So you can post your questions here or you can raise your hand. We'll call out the name and you can ask the question. This is just to have a smooth order. Uh, so anybody has a question, you can speak up now. Raise your hand, please. Anjana Hi, Anand. Sharta. Yes, please. Hi, Anand. This is Geeta Sharma here. Hello, ma'am. Uh, uh, Dr. Balasubraman, it was very, very inspiring to hear Thank you. Uh, you. And Thank uh, you. yes, like I... I love the idea when you said it is I, when people think of emphasizing and saying, no, it is the children or the child you need to focus and not I. So brilliantly captured there. I'm just curious to know a little more on that gram, which is uh, there on your uh, background picture would uh, really help us to know what exactly is that gram all about. Okay. You know, uh, the Vivekananda Youth Movement is very, service delivery operations happen. We go out there, run hospitals, schools, colleges, uh, give scholarships. We believe that if you build human and social capital, we don't believe in serving. We believe that enabling people to grow their human and social capital will have powerful economic consequences. So all those activities are what gets done under the Vivekananda Youth Movement. But the limitation of the Vivekananda Youth Movement is we can only be, we can't be everywhere. We can only be there at where we are and right now we work across Karnataka and we reach around 3 million people and that's that's all you can do right but then um, post my Harvard days I was thinking about how in India if you really want to impact the nation if you want to make sure that the two ways either you can keep scaling up and say I'll work in Karnataka I'll work in Kerala I'll work in 10 states 20 states I'll carry my flag everywhere that's one approach uh, we chose not to take that approach but what other ways can be more impactful ways of doing stuff is by working with the system, working with the government, strengthening it, supporting it, criticizing it, enabling it, but making sure you do it with evidence. Because most of us operate from emotion. I want to do good. I want to help children. I want to teach. Emotion drives us. I was the same. Then I learned to understand that along with emotion, if we can couple it with evidence and understand the real challenges in a very objective manner and design solutions. Today we have we use design thinking and system thinking approaches. You can actually solve problems faster, cheaper, and more more in, embedded into community systems. So keeping that in mind, I thought maybe what India needs is a policy think tank which can understand the government policies from whatever backgrounds they do, uh, evaluate it see the evidence whether it's working or not working, but see it from the community perspective. The speciality of Gram is, I don't see it as a researcher. My training might be in policy and management, but I don't see it as a researcher. I see it as an ordinary person. We work with people and say, what is the community response? What is their voice? In fact, one of my books is called Voices from the Grassroots. How do you capture these voices? Process it in an evidential way, 
write it together and then present it to government and advocate with government and bring about change. So GRAM is an acronym for grassroots research and advocacy movement. And I, this has to be a movement. In India, we all suffer from the disease of generalization. You ask anybody, they'll say crores of rupees are lost in this country. Thousands of people are hungry. Hundreds of people are corrupt. You know, we all generalize. We forget that specificity and sensitivity is also something which is an enabling tool for solving problems. And Gram hopes to capture information from the community, their voices, package it together with evidence, present it to the policymaker, and get them to relook at their policies and thereby impacting possibly the whole nation itself. Yes, uh, Shraddha, uh, ma'am, you, you can please unmute and uh, speak. Good morning, sir. This is Shraddha Maheshwari. Good morning. Sir, as you said, that gram is a movement, right? So why have you restricted it to South India only? Why haven't you thought of extending it to North India as well? We have, it's not limited to South India. We actually uh, try to work on a model of minimizing uh, expenses and you know, looking at virtual offices. We are right now as an office location, we are only in Bangalore and Mysore, but our, uh, our team in Delhi is just virtual. They all work from homes or from wherever office spaces they can discover, where they can sit with a laptop. It could be a Starbucks to a coffee that doesn't matter to us. But right now, Gram is a, right now the projects are in 12 states. So that's because headquarters is my so research is a great uh, field where you don't have to move away from your computer. Today we, we use digital tools. All our surveys are our surveys go with tabs. The moment they enter it, we can validate it from here, triangulate information from here, make sure data integrity is maintained. All that can be done sitting wherever you are. All you need is a good computer with a good algorithm running to pick it up. So we are actually working in 12 states. So wherever we have projects, we go. And if people are interested in that, they bring the research skills and bandwidth, we invite them to join us as consultants. And that's how they are, it's a movement. It doesn't have to be researchers sitting out of Mysore to go doing some work in Chhattisgarh or Jharkhand or Assam. We have people there who just come on for doing those particular studies and then we use the material to advocate. So it's actually national. Hope, we are hoping to be actually South Asia level because these ideas have to be taken to that level in the next three years. So have you set up schools in North India as you've done in the no. region? SUIM is limited only to Karnataka right now. What we do is we share knowledge, we offer training, we build talent, we give thought leadership, we support in capacity building and we help people do it. We take on turnkey projects and do it for them and come back. But we believe we need locally embedded experiments. We can only share knowledge and experience. We have a training institute in Mysore where we share, we train. When people come, we share all knowledge. It's a residential campus in Mysore. It's called the Vivekananda Institute for Leadership Development, where all this development happens. We have, we have a science park in Jamshedpur, but we don't run it. We put it up for Tata Steel in the Jasko school there, and we train their teachers to run it. And whenever they hit a roadblock, they reach out to us. We go back and help them solve it. I believe we should, uh, we NGOs suffer from the fallibility and ego of thinking we are the only ones who can save this world. I think we have to open out and say, without me also things can get done. Sometimes without me, it's better. And we just share information, knowledge, put it on the public domain, hope people will imitate and copy and go do something there. But we support doing it. Thank you, thank you, sir. There is a question from Rajesh Rao in the chat. Yeah, human capital development, what is done to various... Yeah, uh, human capital is what I always talk about, Rajesh, and uh, I know that you are uh, uh, fond of this question every time you challenge me on this, but it's glad to see that. I believe that um, uh, human capital operates in four domains. Let me define human capital for the benefit of all our friends on this show here today. Uh, it's a little more, ex much more expanded uh, than what the World Bank is currently defining it as. Uh, the last 10 years of my work has been, my research and study has been in the space of building human and social capital. To me, human capital uh, is founded on the theory of capability that Amartya Sen propounded, but a more deconstructed version. Uh, human capital is uh, essentially uh, the ability to um, grow our capabilities in the domains of the physical, which means my physical welfare, it could be health programs, it could be nutrition, it could be food security my cognitive develop capabilities, which means schooling, education, awareness, uh, life skills, skill development, all those things under that. 
my emotional capabilities we have forgotten today in, Chile, in today's india we don't even think emotional growth is important so we focus on interpersonal and intrapersonal intelligence in all our programs and finally spiritual capabilities because we believe if you can grow physical cognitive emotional and spiritual capabilities of the person it will enable him to lead and sustain his life it will give him the agency to lead and sustain life so it's not about going to school it's not about degrees that you need to acquire but building capabilities in these four domains and the result would be it will enable us to lead and sustain give us the agency to lead and sustain our lives and that's the only way development can be sustainable so all our programs in svoim run with this philosophy and principle our think that thinking is embedded in this our training programs in we lead we train for, uh, people from the ngo sector we train people from corporate sector from the government sector communities volunteers right now we are planning a program for politicians everything is to see how do we enable growth of their physical cognitive emotional so it may be different technical subjects are opportunities for us to embed this but the undercurrent principle would be this in all our programs thank you thank you doctor we have uh... Uh, i think the next part of rajesh's question is what few trainings that volunteers can take okay. well they can take trainings on leadership that we run they can take trainings on social immersion programs that we have they can take trainings on working with communities they can take training on working with government because a lot of your work we might be in government schools and government children you need to understand the system so this is just a few training programs sorry anil please go ahead. sorry i thank you thank you doctor so we have uh, a question from v ram kumar so mm-hmm. please uh, speak Thank you. Yes. Good morning, Dr. Bala. Uh, morning. Uh, it's very fascinating to listen to you as as always. Um, look, I mean, I going back to the topic of today's discussion and today being the International Volunteers Day. Uh, what would you pick if you were to look at you know organizations around the world that have actually been driven on the bedrock of volunteerism, as Venkat articulated in the beginning of the discussion? and if you had to look around and you know look for traits that have stood out as the success factors for sustenance of these organizations for generations what would you pick as the top two or three traits that are consistent across all these organizations around the world you know um it's a very difficult question i'll try to simplify it and try to give as linear an answer as possible it's very nuanced and loaded and i'm sure um, uh, most of us will appreciate the challenge there's no easy answer for this ram i can only go from a uh, uh, little experience I, i used to be i did a from the fellowship work i did at the kennedy school i worked at a lot of large organizations as consulting them and i would represent harvard as a consultant and i'm just going by that experience so i'm not saying this is the only thing but only limited to my knowledge and experience is what i would uh, precondition my answer with Yeah. what i found was uh, organizations are essentially an aggregation of individuals uh there are three elements i would look at it first element i would say what is the organizational purpose why do you exist and is there a clear understanding of it is there clarity on uh, your theory of change do you understand what you're doing why you're doing how you're doing it and do you know uh, can you answer uh, evidentially with some measuring tools that you're actually doing what you're saying you're doing right all that i would put in the organizational box i think many of us don't know this many of them start with inspirational ideas of the founder and they think okay this child has some crucible experience each of us would have had a child in difficulty i'm inspired to run a school for children and then i start and then these questions come much later it's a matter when they come as long as we have the courage to ask those questions and have the greater courage to start answering them and the greatest courage to know that we don't have answers to them and i think that such organizations sustain an organization which is eternally humble enough to understand it may not have all the answers and keep asking it is the ability to sustain second is organizations are after all individuals individuals has to have to be um if i were to describe it in one sentence it has to be an aggregation of individuals who understand that they may not have the competence to be doing what they are doing uh but have the humility to know that i have to acquire that competence so learning to operate from zones of our incompetence is an extraordinary ability to sustain mm. if the moment you think i know and i can solve this problem i think you can't sustain yourself if you know that you don't know and you have to seek to know and in this the seeking is where sustenance comes and you're constantly seeking the problems are so complex today um personally for me the journey never ends for anybody if you're really humble and so it's that that 
it, it's an embedded with three qualities. So one is to understand that you don't have the competence. Second is having the humility to acquire the competence, the need to learn. And the third is allowing yourself to be vulnerable and say, well, I didn't know it's okay. Now, we are all in situations in life where vulnerability is not celebrated. We think it's a weakness. It's something to be looked down upon. I think it's possible the greatest asset you can have is vulnerability. And in that vulnerability, you will seek answers, solutions, and that will give you enormous strength. And I think these are the qualities that really sustain. And if I were to say, at least I find my sustenance through expressions of these qualities. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Anjana Sharda, you have raised your hand. Would you like to? Yes. Uh, good morning, Dr. Wala and everybody. Uh, so I'll be real quick. Uh, I'm in my early 40s and I have done close to 15 years of corporate experience. Uh, a volunteer by heart because I've seen that culture in my home while growing up. Uh, quit my corporate career uh, basically uh, to balance my work life but to seek also what I was seeking for a long time which is a spiritual enlightenment and have taken up a volunteer volunteerism full time from the last couple of years. I have given it a step ahead also uh, by enrolling in PhD um, in social management and uh, I have found a subject matter experts also uh, but uh, as this uh, line I feel like you said vulnerability. So I'm in that stage wherein I want to do something uh, at a large scale wherein why I opted a PhD in my this uh, at this stage of my life is so that my research publication can make a larger impact, a meaningful impact to a larger audience as compared to what I have been doing in day to day at a grassroots level. Uh, the challenge I'm finding is that, you know, uh, to zero down on what I can do through my research work, through my thesis work, though the broad area I have analyzed is communication for social change, because I thought that's where I can use my uh, corporate skills as well as my personal passion. And um, so can you just help me, doctor, uh, that because I'm at that stage of vulnerability, uh, where I want to be quick in terms of at least finding out the problem that I can invest my another three to four years in researching and try to do something, you know, uh, to make a difference. Uh, I, I really don't know what is your expectation from me. Is it just an answer or something more than that? But the answer is the easiest thing I can give. Something more is a commitment I don't think I have the time bandwidth right now to make. I'll be very honest and candid with you. Uh, uh, if I were to, if you were to ask me, if I were to do a PhD in communication, especially from the perspective of rural development or social management, what would, what would I work on? I, I can say that rather than saying what you should be working on. To me, uh, I always find communication lopsided, unidimensional and hierarchical. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes with the arrogance of saying, we know what the rural poor need. And so I tell them what to accept and they have to take what I give. And we never go there with the attitude of, I don't know what people need. I have to sit and talk to them. I have to understand them. I have to find out ways to discover what is it their perception of needs are find a ways to understand it and then express it to the powers that be and get that done for them. So discovering that tool, which can enable uh, or force a person to become humble and go there with an open heart, with an open mind and truly practice the concept of ideation that we talk in design thinking and brainstorming with people. So how can you communicate to get to work with people rather than communicate to people? would be the biggest question I would wrestle with. And if you can figure that out, I think it will help a lot of us in this space. Because we think we know how to do it, but if you can find out and generate a toolkit or a toolbox which says, these are seven things you keep in mind, or these are the six things you, if you can deconstruct it into the to-do list and what, so we can train our younger generation, we can train the next generation of people. These are the things you watch out for. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Thank you. Doctor, there are a couple of questions. Sure. You can I choose any. The chat, chat box, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking yes. at it. Is yeah. Vivekananda Institute connected to the one in West Bengal? Uh, it depends on what you're meaning. We don't have any legal connection with any organization. Today, connections only signifies legal. Ideologically, philosophically, anything done in the name of Vivekananda, we're all connected anywhere in the world. Uh, we are definitely very well connected to the Ramakrishna mission. Uh, a lot of the monks there are 
people whom we know, we cherish, we respect, we admire and seek guidance from. So the, uh, the Ramakrishna missions across the world, across the country, in West Bengal, which is where it's headquartered, are sources where we get, seek our inspiration and guidance from. The next question is, can, how can you know we can access your trainings? Um, you can just send me an email. I'll possibly, somebody, somebody asked me, how can you reach out to me? I'll give you my email or Anand can share my email with all of you. And you can just email us. I can ask them people to put you on our uh, database and keep you informed of all the training programs. Right now, the last six months, we're only doing online programs. And so this might be an opportunity. We run programs, uh, Gram uh, the, uh, runs programs on called Introduction to Public Policy where we teach people, I think every Indian should understand public policy. And so we teach that level of course. The other program we run is building human and social capital. How do you do it? How do you build it? So all that is something which we do. Uh, the next question is uh, any resistance? So oh, you should read my books. That will tell you about all the resistance I faced. Now I think resistance is the way you get your life built, right? And Vivekananda says it so beautifully. He says all good work has to pass through three stages. First is the stage of ridicule. So people ridicule me. So what can you do? You're a young boy of 19. Your mustache is not grown properly. How can you change this world? All kinds of ridicule. You have to live with it. Then Swamiji says, if you have, he says you need three Ps to endure it. First P is purity. Second is patience. Third is perseverance. If you can cloak yourself with purity, patience, and perseverance, you will have the ability to endure this ridicule. But it doesn't stop with ridicule. After ridiculing you, they will say, you know what, I'll not let you work here. Who are you to come and work in our villages? They'll, do, they'll obstruct you. So first comes ridicule, second comes, you know, um, uh, all these obstructions they can throw at you. And finally, Swamiji says, if you still continue to do, then comes acceptance. The very fact 100 of you are sitting together on a Saturday morning listening to me and Evidyaloka invites me, it's in some sense you've accepted me. So I have gone through the phase of ridicule. I've been, I've gone through the phase of uh, being obstructed and being beaten up, arrested. When you fight the exploiter, when you fight on behalf of the exploited, obviously powerful forces will not like it. And sometimes government is the biggest exploiter in our system. And when you fight the governmental system, government is also a nasty, vindictive animal. It can, it can make your life so miserable that you can spend the next 20 years of your life only walking to the courts. And, and, and I've gone through all that. And when you work with tribals, when other people have other intent, could be conversions, could be all kinds of intent, and their intent is not just human development, then they see you as a stumbling block and they want to create problems for you. So we have gone through all that. We suffer and that's the way, I think those are things which re reiterate your commitment, reinforce your belief that you've got to bring about change. Uh, Ramakrishna mission, uh, Ramakrishna mission trainings may, may not be in sync, uh, but a lot of trainings given by Ramakrishna Ashram are also extraordinarily good. And so you may have to look at for their calendars. It may not be synced with them. No, we don't put it on their sites. So Varija, I hope that answers your question. I want to teach and learn, but no sites seem genuine. Uh, first of all, don't even want to teach. Who are you to teach? I think that's a very arrogant sp space in which to begin. You can say, I want to learn and share my learning. Sharing your learning is different from teaching. Teaching is a very different mindset. So you simply say, I want to learn and I want to enable learning in everybody around me. Enabling learning in everybody is what you should start aspiring to do. The moment you reframe yourself as teaching, then the I becomes stronger. The moment you frame it as enabling everybody's learning, that's a beautiful spiritual experience. I think I must have ended, taken more time than what is necessary, Anand. So I uh, don't want to yes. screw up everybody's morning. Rajesh, it's good yeah. to see you on video now. <laughs> we have Ashish Singh. Let's take this as a last question. Sure. I post that I have a video to play and then we can close. Yes, Ashish Singh, please. Uh, good, good morning, all. Uh, so, uh, just out of curiosity, I have this one question. Sure. And since you have already brought in government's role about uh, the last question, which was asked to you, mm -hmm. and and so we read a lot that uh, you know the problem with any government policy is not with the planning, but with its implementation and execution. So, uh, do you think is it really the case, or is there some some more problem to it? Something to do with the intent? innovative solutions or, or maybe lack of understanding of the real problem which we have? The combination of several of these things, uh, Ashish, uh, what I feel is 
you know, we don't even know what is policy. We don't even understand the word public policy. We don't, we think we know in a simple way, public policy, if I were to define it in 30 seconds, is the intent and action of government. So the two things there, the intent and the action, right? So why is the government doing what, like what is the farm bill, the recent agitation that we are seeing, what could have been the intent of the government and how does it manifest as action? If the intent of the government is, is it as one set of people argue and say the intent of government was to enable farmers to catch up with the market economy and not get stuck in their own APMCs and MSPs and uh, in the crutches of the state governments and taking away their money, but giving, making it a global market for them so they can get the best price. Now that's a great intent. As a policy analyst, as a development economist, I would say that's a wonderful thing to happen. But some people argue and say the intent is to encroach on state territory because agriculture is a state mandate by the Indian constitution. So who is right? That's where a policy analyst like me comes in and starts arguing about it. So there's several dimensions and complexities to public policy and you can't have one easy answer. The problem is we have news, uh, television commentators today who are experts in vi uh, virology this morning, epidemiology in the afternoon, public health in the evening, and then uh, vaccine production tomorrow morning, and then vaccine distribution tomorrow evening, and then uh, movie expert and talking of Kangana Ranga run out or whatever that lady is, and then about uh, 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 Bombay Municipal Corporation to political election, everything they're expert. And you see the same faces on television. And we start believing it's a linear process. It's so easy to give our opinions. So I think uh, we can actually assess it. India suffers from challenges of implementation. Any good public policy we say should pass through three filters for it to be effective. And even if one filter is weak or one system, which I'm going to describe now is weak, you cannot implement it. The first filter is any policy made should be evidentially sound. It should be backed, only then you will see the change, right? If you say 10,000 people don't have education, this program will get education for 10,000. That evidence of 10,000 people not having education, evidence that this can bring about learning outcomes, both are necessary. So it should be an evidentially sound, scientifically sound thinking. Second filter we say is administratively feasible they able to deliver it. We can conceive a vaccine distribution system in the United States, just because they have a high end country and high technology. I can tell you, United States will mess, mess up vaccine distribution. United Kingdom will deliver it better. India will deliver it the best. Nobody knows this, but Indian healthcare systems, public health systems, especially in vaccinations, in immunization programs, we are on the finest public health mechanisms to distribute vaccines and deliver on it. Maybe because private sector didn't mess it up, it's still good. So my way of looking at it is we can deliver on it. So administrative feasibility. And the third is political sustainability. Every stakeholder affected by the policy must necessarily um, be believing in what you're doing. Even if one step, uh, like farmers of Punjab and Haryana are not believing in the farm loss. It's not politically sustainable. And they're so powerful, the lobby is so powerful, they can make it look as though every farmer in India is protesting, right? and they have such global connections, it can shift the narrative itself. So all three components are important. Coincidentally, that is the latest article I've written on my blog right now. I start the article calling it to ban or not to ban. It's about firecrackers and then say, was banning firecrackers good? Not banning firecrackers good in Karnataka and the vacillation of the Karnataka government's policy. Using that as an example, I describe it. And so that, that might answer your question more fully. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Somebody is asking you something. Is that Telugu? They are asking yeah. Canada. Yeah, we have, uh, have quite a few people from the villages uh, as well. Actually, they are our feet in our people who actually I, are making the difference. If anyone wants to speak, please uh, uh, go ahead and ask a question in your own language. Uh, we someone will translate. Tamil, Hindi, Canada. I'm okay. I can answer in the same language. But if it's any other language, you translate it for me, and I can answer. Uh, Divya, I can see somebody. If you want Divya, you can turn on your video and ask your video uh, question if you have. She has something to say. Uh, uh, unmute, Chayandi. Somebody in Telugu can. Just, yeah. Hello, sir. Namaste, dear. Vana, sir. Namaskar. Uh, 
మమ్మల్ని ప్రోత్సహిస్తూ తెలియని విషయాలు చెప్తూ మాకు పిల్లలకి ఇలా చేయండి అలా చేయండి మల్లికార్జున్ సార్ ట్రైనింగ్ ఇస్తూ ప్రతి మంత్ లోని మాకు పిల్లలకి ఇలా చేయండి అమ్మా ఫోన్ ద్వారా వీడియోస్ ఫార్వర్డ్ చేయండి వాళ్ళు ఎలా చదువుతున్నారో కొంచెం చూ చెక్ చేయండి అని చాలా రెస్పాన్సిబిలిటీ ఒక గవర్నమెంట్ టీచర్ లాగా కూడా మేము అంతకంటే ఎక్కువనే ఫీల్ అవుతున్నాం సార్ ఈ విషయంలో పిల్లల చదువు కోసం అని వీళ్ళు చేసే ప్రతి విషయంలో ఉంది సార్ ప్రతి అడుగు కూడా వాళ్ళకు చాలా యూస్ఫుల్ గా ఉంటుంది సార్ మాకు మొన్న నుంచి ఎస్ఈఎల్ క్లాసెస్ మొన్న ఒకరోజు నేను ఒకరోజు జరిగింది సార్ పిల్లలు ఇప్పటి నుంచి ఎలా ఆలోచించాలి ఎలా ఎదగాలి సమాజంలోని ప్రతిదీ ధైర్యంగా ఎలా నేర్చుకోవాలి అనేది మేడం చెప్పారు సార్ ఫస్ట్ క్లాస్ లోనే వాళ్ళు చాలా ఇంట్రెస్ట్ గా అన్నారు సార్ ఆన్లైన్ క్లాసెస్ అంటే ముందు వాళ్ళకున్న భయం ఆ సిస్టమ్ ముందు ఎలా అనేది ఆ భయం అనేది పోయింది సార్ వాళ్ళు చాలా ఇంట్రెస్ట్ చూపిస్తున్నారు సార్ మేము చదవాలి మేము నేర్చుకోవాలి స్కూలు చాలా రోజులు అయింది కదా మూసేసి మాకు ఇలా కోఆర్డినేషన్ and like i put my email out there and i'll possibly type in my website also so in case people are interested to stay in touch and sure. like, like any author you buying my book and saying the book is good will possibly make my day too thank you thank you thank you doctor